morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. So I'm going to talk about uh, the critical care management of subarachnoid hemorrhage and what really matters in subarachnoid hemorrhage. You want to rapidly identify patients that have aneurysm of subarachnoid hemorrhage because the number one reason for subarachnoid hemorrhage is not aneurysmal, it's actually traumatic. You also want to identify the aneurysm that has caused the subarachnoid hemorrhage rapidly. You want to manage the blood pressure because many of these patients are presenting with elevated blood pressure. And you want to have that under control till you treat the aneurysm, but not afterward. And we'll talk about why. You want to detect and manage the early complications, which includes stress cardiomyopathy, neurogenic pulmonary edema, cerebral salt wasting, which you start to see a few days into the subarachnoid hemorrhage, detect vasospasm, and that can be clinically, electrophysiologically, sonographically, or radiologically, and manage the vasospasm, and also treat subarachnoid hemorrhage in high volume centers, and we'll talk about why that is. So guidelines have been established by the American Heart Association for the management of subarachnoid hemorrhage, as well as by the Neurocritical Care Society. Um, it, this was a consensus statement on how to manage subarachnoid hemorrhage. The early complications that you would be concerned about in patients presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage is re-bleeding, most importantly. Subsequent to that is vasospasm and everything else uh, that's listed on the slide that we'll be going through. Uh, the problem with rebleeding is that it increases mortality and morbidity. And the highest risk is in the first 24 hours, and you see it in about 15% of patients, with the most common timing for this happening being in the first six hours of symptom onset. And the risks for rebleeding are high blood pressure, poor neurological grade at presentation, posterior circular, uh, circulation aneurysms, in particular basilar tip aneurysms, Aneurysms that are large, and it, we consider an aneurysm to be large if it's greater than 10 millimeters. If you have concomitant intracerebral hemorrhage as well as intraventricular hemorrhage. And one of the ways that you can prevent this rebleeding from happening is to use uh, tranexamic acid or aminocaproic acid if there is no contraindication. So if you have a high grade patient that's coming in with quite a bit of subarachnoid hemorrhage, what we, and we are concerned that the treatment of that aneurysm is going to be delayed, or on the occasion when you actually do not find the aneurysm, what we do is we actually start them on tranexamic acid, and that continues on only for 72 hours. And if they're going to go for treatment, we stop it at least three hours prior to the treatment. So um, here are the things that happen within the first few hours, uh, in particular the first 48 hours of a subarachnoid hemorrhage occurring, that can lead to poor outcomes. And a lot of these things you don't necessarily see. This is happening at a microscopic level, and I do not have a pointer. So I'm just gonna try to use one. I apologize, I did find it. Yep, it's here. So the things that are happening in the first 48 hours are all of what puts the patient at a high risk for developing delayed cerebral ischemia. And top up there is re-bleeding. And these are the things that you are not really seeing, the microcirculatory spasm, the microembolism. You do realize when somebody has an elevated intracranial pressure because neurologically they're going to uh, look comatose, obtunded, and you can see hydrocephalus in your CT scans as well. So the mechanism that's happening here is that you have transient global ischemia in the setting of that hemorrhage occurring in a tight skull, and the intracranial pressures are going up, which in turn leads to decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure being a component of the intracranial pressure and the mean arterial pressure. What this can lead to is breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, all of those microscopic changes that we're talking about, decreased nitric oxide, elevated potassium, oxidative stress, inflammation, and all of that ultimately leads to a sympathetic system activation and secondary changes that you're also seeing systematic, systemically, which is pulmonary edema, cardiac dysfunction, 
And you can have a multitude of other systemic inflammatory changes as well. So a lot of this, again, is not directly visualized when your patient is in front of you. Some of the things that you have control over is managing their elevated intracranial pressure. So uh, systemic inflammatory response is very, very common in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And many of them develop fever, elevated respiratory rate, elevated white count, and in our ICUs, we're always making sure that it isn't a secondary infection that's causing the changes that you're looking at. So always make sure that you're ruling out infection as the etiology, because after all, your patients are critically ill. They're in an ICU setting. But if you do not find a source of infection and that has been ruled out, then what you're really looking at is the effect of that subarachnoid hemorrhage causing the systemic inflammatory response. Now, based on this and many other papers, we do know that patients who develop a surge response are more likely to not fare well. And so if you have a surge response in the absence of infection and there's a higher burden of, uh, and it independently predicts symptom, system, sorry, symptomatic vasospasm and is associated with worse outcomes. And this is what those outcomes look like. The higher your source burden, the higher the rate of vasospasm, up to 44%, and the poorer the outcome. So what are we doing to monitor for vasospasm? Now, I, I just want to clarify that the terminology vasospasm is kind of a, a bit archaic at this point, even though we usually still refer to it as vasospasm, it is delayed cerebral ischemia because delayed cerebral ischemia as a terminology encompasses vasospasm as well as all of the other things that you see in the setting, which is decline in neurological status, as well as strokes that you're seeing on the skin. So DCI is the more broader term that is used to describe vasospasm. What we do in our ICUs is to monitor for this vasospasm using transcranial Dopplers. And this has been historic and it still continues and that's just the way we practice medicine. Does transcranial Doppler monitoring actually help you identify patients with vasospasm? And that's what this paper is looking at. And what they concluded is that TCD flow velocities implied only a mild incremental risk for delayed cerebral ischemia after subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the maximal sensitivity for the TCD to detect vasospasm was at day eight. But nearly 40% of patients with DCI never actually attained high enough flow velocities, which is what we're looking for with the TCDs during the course of monitoring. So the overall sensitivity of a TCD to identify vasospasm is actually quite poor. So then why do the TCDs? Well, it makes us feel good about the fact that we're doing something to monitor them, but there is a trend that we do look at. It's not the absolute value that we're looking at, but if the velocities are going up as the days go by, then the concern that these patients are developing vasospasm is high, and then the clinical observation of these patients and making sure that they are not developing neurological deterioration is heightened. So it just helps us monitor the patient slightly better. It is not an absolute value. So what about continuous EG in monitoring patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage? The original papers were, the original uh, studies were really just looking at um, seizures because patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage are at a high risk for having not necessarily electrographic, but, um, uh, sorry, not necessarily clinical, but electrographic seizures, and that's where this came from. But what people started noticing is that, so for anyone who doesn't understand EEGs, the, the quick and dirty, and that's all I know as well, is that there are four different kinds of patterns that you see on an EEG. You have alpha, which is normal. You have beta, which is also technically normal. And theta and delta are the slower rhythms that you see, and usually theta-delta rhythms are seen when there's brain injury. So what they started recognizing was the fact that when patients were developing vasospasm or DCI, that the, the, the rhythm started changing from alpha to delta. And this prediction for this alpha to delta change happened way before the patients became neurologically symptomatic. And so when, if you are doing continuous EG monitoring, you can actually quantify the amount of alpha 
and it is the composite alpha index, or you can do the ratio between the alpha and the delta because the delta goes up and the alpha comes down, so it's known as the alpha-delta ratio, and that helps you predict who are patients that are at risk uh, and probably need to be treated sooner than later. So this is the composite uh, picture of what that looks like, and here's a patient, here are the EG leads, left, right, anterior, posterior, as you can see, and as you hit day six, you start to see that the alpha ratios are going down. And here, the patient starts to become uh, clinically symptomatic. They do a CT, and they're starting to see infarcts. They send the patient for angio, which is the gold standard for looking at vasospasm, and they see severe MCA spasm. The spasm is treated, and the, the, del the ratios don't quite improve in spite of that, which means that ischemia has already occurred or infarction has already occurred. And ultimately, when they do a CT at day, I believe it's uh, 48, they see widespread infarction. But what the EEG did was it started detecting early ischemia 24 hours before the patient became symptomatic. Now, is this a routine for us to do quantitative EEG uh, monitoring in our ICUs? Not necessarily, because you do need specialized um, um, e electrographers that can read the quantitative EEG and also the technology that measures this. And so not every place has the ability to do it, but if you do, then this is great. If nothing, even visually, you can see that the alpha is changing to delta. So with regards to radiographic diagnosis of vasospasm, Remember that only half of the patients with angiographic vasospasm actually have clinical findings. So it's not everyone that has vasospasm that needs to be treated for vasospasm. It all comes down to their clinical exam. If they are symptomatic as a result of what you know is radiographic vasospasm, yes, that patient needs to be treated because the risk of doing harm because you tried to treat the vasospasm is significantly high. So the conventional angiography is the gold standard because it gives you good de definition of large and medium-sized vessel vessels and also allows you to do treatment, which is intra-arterial calcium channel blockers, which is what we use for, va for vasospasm, or you can do the angioplasty. And we, if we have concern now, have shifted to doing CT angiograms to confirm that what you're looking at, because not only do you get an imaging of the vessels, you also get an imaging of the brain that tells you that it's actually vasospasm as opposed to something else like worsening hydrocephalus or new infarcts that have already occurred that are beyond the scope of anything that an angiography can do uh, that have caused the decline in the patient. So prophylactically, what can you do? Um, volume repletion, because you don't want them to be dehydrated. And um, nimodipine historically has been used now for decades in the management of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's not that we know for a fact that nimodipine prevents vasospasm. It is more of a neuroprotective effect from the use of nimodipine. And an alternative is to use nicardipine, which is an IV formulation of a calcium channel blocker. And if you're going to use it, then use it at uh, 0.075 milligrams per kilogram per hour, because it kind of gives you the same sort of benefit um, as uh, using nimodipine. So uh, before I go into hypervolemic therapy, I just also want to mention that we also, as uh, an exception, will use intraventricular nicardipine. Um, because that also does help with the treatment, especially of the more distal. But these are exceptional cases when everything we're doing is not working and uh, angioplasty hasn't helped as well. So hypervolemia as a therapy for vasospasm uh, has been taken out of the guidelines, and this is the reason why. This was a study that looked at uh, 82 patients that received hypervolemia or normal volemia, and what they did find is that hypervolemia did increase cardiac filling pressures and fluid intake, but it did not increase the cerebral blood flow or blood volume compared to normal volemia. And this is what that graph looks like. Here are the patients that this is uh, looking at the global uh, cerebral blood flow in hypervolemia versus normal volemia. And here's the normal volemic group. The blood flow was actually perhaps a little bit better than um, the pa patients who were hypervolemic. 
the only benefit that they uh, got out of the hypervolemia is uh, for those patients who don't have normal kidney function is they developed volume overload. If you have normal kidney function, they just pee out everything that you're giving them. So really, it comes down to maintaining normal bulimia or eubulimia. Now, this trial uh, just completed, and the results are not published as yet, uh, but the preliminary information is available. This was a uh, phase three multicenter randomized trial that looked at the use of nemodipine microparticles to enhance recovery administered intraventricularly or intrathecally. And uh, the primary endpoint was to see favor was to look at favorable outcomes in the extended Glasgow outcome scale at 90 days after a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, unfortunately, this trial was a failure, even though the preliminary studies did show some benefit from it. And we were a site that enrolled patients in this as well. And uh, the hope was that by giving the nemodipine intraventricularly, the side effect of nemodipine, which is hypotension, would be reduced and that you would have the benefit of preventing vasospasm. It, was, it, it did not help. So then how do you manage vasospasm in BCI? Uh, volume expansion when the patient is symptomatic, not otherwise. So if the patient is developing a neurological deficit, yes, then we will give them a bolus of fluids and start them on IV hydration. If the patient is not adequately hydrated based on numbers, and at this point, we don't even monitor the I's and O's or the input and the output. Uh, we don't use Foley's anymore to accurately look at what the urine output is. It really looking at the numbers. You can look at the sodium, you can look at the B1, you can look at the creatinine, you can look at the bicarb. And you can also clinically examine the patient and look and see if they are uh, dehydrated. If so, we would put, we'll put them on maintenance fluids. But if they are actually developing a deficit, then we will give them a fluid bolus and crack up the rate while we're trying to get to the bottom of why do they have a neurological deficit and whether they should go for angiography or not. You can induce hypertension, and this does work. Once the aneurysm is treated, we usually liberalize the blood pressure goals. Um, we say mean arterial pressure from 70 to 150, and if, we, if they're clinically uh, starting to deteriorate, we will put them on a presser, and we will in augment their blood pressure. And these patients do respond to this treatment, and, and I speak from my experience, and not necessarily based on uh, literature that provides that uh, supporting documentation. You can augment the cardiac output as well. Uh, you can use dopamine or dobutamine or milbrodone. Uh, you can also use an intra-aortic balloon pump because if you have a patient whose cardiac function is compromised, then you really don't have any other option but to use an intra-aortic balloon pump. Having said that, I have never used one. Uh, if you're using dobutamine or milbrodone, remember you do need to monitor the cardiac output as well. Uh, Non-invasive methods are available in our institution. We do have a flow track. And it really is a device that you attach to an arterial line, and you can get uh, pretty, pretty good numbers, assuming that everything else is stable. And again, these are trends. These are not uh, independent numbers that you um, depend on. The ultimate treatment, of course, is to send the patient for angioplasty. Uh, nothing else works. And they can use verapamil or nicardipine. Um, moving on to cerebral salt wasting. Uh, majority of the patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage who are developing DCI, you will start to notice that their sodium is trending down. And there is um, a, quite a bit of a disagreement between us neurologists and the rest of the world, whether this is cerebral salt wasting, or is this renal salt wasting, or is it SIADH? And all we can say based on evidence is that volume depletion does put subarachnoid hemorrhage patients at risk for stroke if they have vasospasm. Now, this is what um, a, a typical subarachnoid, high-grade subarachnoid patient would do. Uh, here is their urine output. You'll start to see that around day four or five, this urine output starts to go up. You'll start to see that the fractional ex excretion of sodium starts to go up, and the urinary sodium levels start to go up, and this is all within a certain time frame, usually around days five to seven, that you see this happening. So the question, is it cerebral or renal? For us, it is cerebral because there's a very specific time frame within which this is happening, and this can be treated with sodium, and they do respond to sodium and volume. But the key thing is to remember that, the, that 
the concern for SIADH and volume restricting these patients because you think it's SIADH is definitely not the way to go. So you want to replete plasma volume because the hypovolemic state can be masked by the catecholamine state that these patients are in as a result of the subarachnoid hemorrhage and volume restriction is contraindicated in these patients. If you really, really want to know what to do, you can measure the urine osmolality and administer a fluid that has higher osmolality to the, to the urine. And 1.8% uh, saline gives you 616 milliosmoles per liter, while 3% gives you uh, 1,027 milliosmoles per liter. In our, uh, uh, remember that if you're using 3%, you do need a central line, preferably because it can extravasate, it can cause thrombophlebitis, uh, unless you're extremely careful. It's not that you cannot use 3% preferably, you can, but it has to be used with a lot of caution. 2% is also available. I don't know if it's available here, but 2% can very easily be given um, peripherally. Uh, it doesn't have the same amount of sodium or the osmolality, so the effect of 2% is not quite as good as 3%. And these patients may remain in salt wasting for extended periods of time. We've seen patients go up to 21 days, 22 days in salt wasting. We also, in addition, give salt tablets as well as Florinac, both of which will help Salt is giving more salt. Florinep will help hold on to the salt and water in these situations. Neurogenic pulmonary edema is a not that uncommon complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you can see symptomatic pulmonary edema in about 20% of patients. And you do get detectable oxygenation abnormalities in about 80% of these. And the potential mechanism for neurogenic pulmonary edema is the hypersympathetic state as a result of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, it can also be because it's cardiogenic, because they can get a stunned myocardium, and we'll talk about it in a second, or you can just get pure neurogenic pulmonary edema. Now, the way to determine that this is purely neurogenic is to make sure that the ejection fraction is normal and there's no other reason why this patient has uh, pulmonary edema. And how to manage this? Well, you have to diurese them. Right? So it's uh, it, while diuresing a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage is historically taught as a no-no. If that's what the patient needs, then that's what you're going to do. Because otherwise, you're going to end up in a much worse off situation. You have to oxygen the patient. Yes, you have some tolerance to how much FiO2 they're on. But if your needs are going higher and higher, and this is the only way to manage it, then you have to diurese them cautiously and watch the volume status. Now, Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy is um, a well uh, heard of, and uh, Takotsubo, of course, re uh, refers to the, um, the, the trap used for um, octopus in, 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 uh, in Japan, and is not that uncommon, again, in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what you're looking at here is the apical and midventricular akinesia that you see in patients that come in with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, usually, these patients will be relatively hypotensive because the um, body usually drives the blood pressure up in the setting of elevated intracranial pressure and to maintain a perfusion, and these patients will be the ones sitting with normal blood pressure. So get an echo or do an echo, and you can see the stunning. The EF can drop as low as 10%, and you may have to supplement, augment them during this time course, but they usually recover from Takotsubo's, and if you repeat an echo, say about a week or 10 days out, you will see that the ejection fraction has improved. It's really related to the sympathetic uh, storming or drive in the setting of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The other common thing that you see in patients presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage is an elevation in troponin. Uh, we do EKGs and troponins and echoes in all of our subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. And this is a publication that found an association between an elevation in troponin I as well as uh, acute lung injury. And they concluded that uh, troponin I is elevated, uh, when it's elevated, has a direct correlation with acute lung injury as well as ARDS in patients presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it could be a marker, just something to keep at the back of your mind. Uh, and also recognize that you can get all kinds of EKG changes 
uh, in patients presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage, it is important to make sure that the EKG changes are not correlating to a, some sort of a cardiac arterial distribution and that this isn't an actual MI that's happening older patients with underlying coronary artery disease. You may see it, and it, it, it should be treated if that's the case. But generally speaking, it is as a result of what's going on in the brain. Fever burden. I think just about every high-grade patient, contest three and higher, you will, uh, you will find that they have fever, and fever is associated with poor outcome, and this publication talks about just that. So if you have a patient who has a fever, as we spoke about, SERS response is common. Make sure it's not an infection. If it's not an infection, control the fever. What we do in our institution is we schedule them on, on Tylenol, paracetamol, and uh, if that alone is not working, we will put them on normothermia. And normothermia is external cooling. You do have intravascular devices, but external cooling is the e quickest and easiest way to go because fever is bad for the brain. It exacerbates everything else that's going on in the brain for these patients. About 6% of patients can suffer a seizure at the onset of the hemorrhage. And this is very, very often misrepresented uh, in the sense that Everybody gets put on seizure treatment slash prophylaxis. If they've had a seizure, treat it as a seizure. If they've not had a seizure and there's concern that they can develop seizure. Now, what's the problem with having a seizure if the aneurysm is not treated is that your intracranial pressure can go up and you can cause a rupture of the aneurysm, which, as we know, causes worse outcomes. So at least in the peri- treatment period of that aneurysm, we will prophylax them. Do we know that prophylaxis works? No. Do we know that Keppra is good for the brain? No. We know that dilantin is not, or phosphenitoin is not. It has poorer outcomes. No, no one's actually studied the effect of Keppra. But what we do is, uh, or levetiracetam, uh, what we do is put them on 500 milligrams twice a day, and as soon as the aneurysm is treated, we do discontinue the Keppra. However, if this is a patient who truly had a seizure, they will remain on that Keppra. We do continuous EG monitoring, and in the longer term, usually about three months, we, we reassess for whether they can come off of the treatment or not. Also recognize that you can see post-operative seizures in about 1.5% of patients, despite anti-convulsant con convulsant tr treat prophylaxis, and you should also consider other causes because some of your patients may be alcoholics. Simple as that. And you can get alcohol withdrawal seizures. And those, again, have to be treated as alcohol withdrawal seizures. Uh, patients who develop DCI may also develop seizures be after reperfusion because you have a high o oligemic area of the brain. You just reopen that, and now there's uh, blood flow going back into that perhaps partially ischemic brain, and that can trigger seizures as well. And about 3% of patients can have late seizures, which means that they didn't have it during the acute phase, but they developed seizures subsequently. So these are just things to keep at the back of your mind. And if there's hydrocephalus, uh, either clinically or radiographically, they should have a ventriculostomy placed. And if, you're, if you have uh, an external ventricular drain placed, you do have to monitor for infection. Uh, we have uh, switched to using uh, bactericidal or uh, antibacterial coated catheters, which has taken out the need for antibiotic prophylaxis during that time frame. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't develop a secondary infection. Uh, it just means that the risk is uh, less. And at times, these patients may not um, be able to get those drains out safely, and you might have to do a VP shunt on these patients. So. Who are the best people to treat a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage? And this particular publication addresses just that. High volume centers have better experience with treating these patients, not just treating the aneurysm, but also treating the post-operative 14-day course or so of patients presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is a nice little algorithm for how long do you need to monitor patients after they've had their aneurysm treated and they've come in with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, I don't know how well this projects, but if they are low grade, then you can probably monitor them for about um, five to seven days or so. And you don't really necessarily need to do hourly neurological exam on these patients. Perhaps every four hours is more than sufficient. Convincing your neurosurgery counterparts might be a whole another ball game, but this should be just fine. If you have uh, patients who are a high grade subarachnoid hemorrhage, then they definitely do need to be monitored uh, hour on the hour. 
and you do need to do all of the other things uh, to monitor them for DCI as well. Uh, with regards to prognosis, sudden death at the onset of subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs in about 20% of patients, and of the remainder with early surgery, 58% do regain pre-morbid level of function, which is a pretty good number. Uh, about 26% can subsequently die as well. So the uh, total death rate as a result of subarachnoid hemorrhage, both acutely and then subacutely, uh, is about half of the patients that do not make it. But of the ones that make it, about half of them can actually go back to being the way they were before this occurred. Um, global cognitive impairment is a real problem after subarachnoid hemorrhage. And about 20% of patients uh, that have survived to one year will have uh, cognitive impairment. And these are the factors that contribute towards it. Fever, high-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, hyperglycemia, anemia, and of course, DCI. Um, so for patients who present with very poor grade exams at the onset of subarachnoid hemorrhage, there is a tendency to assume that they're not going to do well. And this particular publication shows that at least 50% of them, if you provide them with aggressive, timely care, can do well. So it's very important not to give up. If they have come to you and they have some sort of an exam, be aggressive. Sometimes it may be as simple as placing a drain and things improve. Uh, but good care definitely makes a difference. And this is the last slide is my team at Rush. We're all neurointensivists. That means we're neurology trained, neurocritical care trained people. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>